Welcome to Stan the Energy Man. Stan Osterman here from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies. And we're off and running with another show on your lunch hour and my lunch hour and try to learn some more about energy and what's going on in Hawaii with um, a little bit of different tact on the energy this time. Our, our guest today is Brendan Hayashi from Aptera uh, Energy. They're a, a, lo a company that's got, a, got some local roots here, done a lot of work uh, in the last couple of years in the energy market and um, done some projects and is currently working on some projects with the Department of Education. And uh, we're going to talk about, you know, what his company does and, and the kind of things that Hawaii can look forward to uh, in the world of decarbonizing and what we can do to, to get uh, away from fossil fuels. So, Brandon, thanks for joining us. Thank you uh, very much, I appreciate you being on the air with us today and uh, talk a little bit about what you do. So, how did you get started in... Uh, in the kind of work that you're doing, mm -hmm. and then tell us a little bit about Up Uptera. Sure, sure. I'll make a very long story as short as possible. Okay. Uh, prior to 2005, everything I had done pretty much was uh, within the realm of Japanese-related things. Mm -hmm. And in 2005, I had my first son, and then shortly thereafter, Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth, came out. And being a new father and trying to think ahead what I want for my son and the kind of world that he's going to be growing up in, that really shook me to my core. Mm -hmm. And while I didn't know a whole lot about the science that was displayed and talked about in the movie, it certainly encouraged me to do my own research. And right. essentially about a year after really going down that path of, of looking into the data, the statistics, the science itself behind climate change, I decided to make a major shift in myself and went to graduate school in the UK and with the intention of actually working for Toyota at Europe and hopefully working on the Prius line. But again, through, through life, right? Interesting things happen. The plan B. Exactly, yeah. or C or D, whatever you want to call it, right? But things kind of coalesced together and uh, basically ended up moving down under to New Zealand. Wow. And uh, together with a, a gentleman from South Africa, we got a bunch of equity partners together. And from there, uh, basically tried to create New Zealand's first energy service company, which is what I did my master's mm. dissertation on. And then from there, I came back here and started working in the local uh, environment here within the energy sector and the rest is history. And then you got started working with Uptera? Yeah, so I actually worked originally with energy industries, mm -hmm. cut my teeth really on the mechanical um, and lighting efficiency side of work mm -hmm. within the private sector, commercial industrial sectors, and then came to Uptera about two years ago. So your background's engineering most primarily? No, or? no. So I actually, mine was on the business side. Okay. So really when we're looking at things from an energy <coughs> service company, what, which I did the dissertation on, of course, I was really looking at it from a business perspective. Okay. How does energy make sense to those who have the ability to make the financial decision to move forward on the technical solution? Great. That's great because, you know, one of the things that, and I, I think about two shows ago, I talked about critical thinking, and really, a lot of people just go into these energy projects or energy challenges, and and they they just look at the first the first impacts, and they don't really look at the economic, the uh, the bigger, the macroeconomic scale impacts. Like, where are you getting your supply from? Is it the only place you get it? Um, what if it's not available? And mm -hmm. then you know, does it? Because most big companies they're looking for at least three at least three supply chains in their operations or they're not going to go there because mm -hmm. it's too much risk. They won't take the risk. So, you know, what are some of the business aspects of, you know, as you go into energy projects, you know, how deep do, does a company like Uptera think about um, the business side of it, uh, not just the technology side, but the sure, business side? Sure, sure, absolutely. So, I mean, to your point, you know, when you're looking at things, in many cases, what folks are looking at, if they're not really in tune and, and digging down into the energy side of things, right, their, their first introduction is many times they're just looking at first cost, mm -hmm. right? What is the potential cost savings? Return on investment. Right, right away. very simple yeah. return investment or simple payback period, right. which is just an inversion of the other, right? And they're looking at that first cost only calculation and not factoring other aspects such as the ongoing cost of energy and where that's right. potentially trending as well as the operations and maintenance costs of or the, cost of savings. the technology you're buying exactly and then to your point about looking at supply chains you have to look at in many cases manufacturers do matter mm -hmm. because you have to factor in warranties availability of equipment right who on the island again there are certain constraints on our islands with respect to warranty honoring that warranty, who can actually do the work and so forth. So that's, that's at that general level when we're talking to almost any kind of customer, basically elevating their understanding and awareness of what you should be looking at. And there's a lot of things regarding energy that don't have to necessarily do with financing or the financial impact of it, but really what is the business impact, right? And that's really where I think the biggest component or components need to be examined. So, for example, you, you mentioned, right, we're working with the Department of Education here. At the end of the day, the Department of Education is not here to have more efficient buildings. 
They're here to educate our future right. leaders. Exactly. And so you're trying to create a learning environment that is optimal so that those students can absorb as much as possible mm -hmm. and have the critical thinking so that when they're dealing with the challenges that our and the generation before us created through climate change, they can solve for that. Yeah. And that's really what we're talking about. When we drive towards energy projects, you know, you're looking at everything on the renewable side, the efficiency side, as we move forward, certainly on the microgrid, net zero energy campuses with energy storage systems. But really what you're looking at is a solution that fits the needs for the client. Right. So that's how we generally approach most of our clients. That's good to hear because that's really critical. I mean, I see too many folks that just look at, you know, when am I going to turn my first profit or, you know, what's my return right. on investment? And, and a lot of times, a cursory look at it is like, oh, it doesn't pencil out, and they move on. Exactly. And, and really, like you say, the more critical thing is, what's the requirement? What's the real need? Mm -hmm. You know, I deal with the military a lot, and they'll pay a premium price because it's a no-fail mission. Mm -hmm. They've got to do the mission. Mm -hmm. And so if the technology costs a little bit more, then it costs a little bit more, but it's got to be able to work all the time. Right, right. The reliability aspect of right. things is very, very key. So it's, it's that customer support and what they're really, they're really after that's important too in the business model. Absolutely. You know, people oftentimes are talking about efficiency and efficiency is good. All aspects from energy efficiency to business efficiency. Mm -hmm. But I think really we should be migrating the discussion to be about efficiency in all aspects of it to effectiveness. And I right. think that's what you're talking yes, about on the exactly. military side. Because even for the schools, right? We're talking about the impact to the classrooms. That's effectiveness. When we can help the students learn more and better, that's the effectiveness that we're driving exactly. for through you the work that we do. You can save tons of money and, and totally miss your mission. Yes. You can save lots of money and, not, and fail. Right. So um, that's great to hear. Right. Well, what are some of the kinds of things that, that Uptera's worked on in the past mm -hmm. here in Hawaii. You mentioned some things about Kamehameha schools. Right, right. So here in the islands itself, Aptera Hawaii has um, done past work with Kamehameha schools, with Oceanic Time Warner, um, some work also with Maui, or excuse me, Kauai Community College, as well as uh, Kahimohana. Mm -hmm. what, and what kind of projects were those? A lot of those projects were based on uh, photovoltaic systems, okay. some rooftop, some canopy systems, and then some energy efficiency, efficiency work as well work. too. Okay. Yeah. And then a little bit of consulting uh, in the process as well. Okay. Yeah. And you say that a lot of your um, focus now is on Department of Education? Correct. And the Department of Education program itself is called the Kohei program. Mm -hmm. And what the Kohei program is really about, originally was called the Energy Efficiency and Sustainability Master Plan, but you know, having worked with the military, <laughs> EESMP is not such a sexy <laughs> word. So thanks to the um, Hawaiian Immersion Program, they came up with Kohei. And the reason why that, that really resonates and is relevant for the program is the He, when referred to as a noun, is that snare or that net that Maui used to capture the right, sun, right? right. right? Mm -hmm. And when used as a verb, it refers to being able to absorb as in knowledge or skill. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what this program is. So it's a, it's a four pillar program, how I oftentimes describe it. You have energy efficiency, renewable energy, energy storage systems and net zero energy campuses, and then importantly, standards aligned curriculum. So it is that curriculum that ties all the dots together on the return on investment side of energy work so that it actually becomes relevant for the students themselves. And it is from those energy cost savings that are delivered from the first three of the four pillars that financially, sustainably support the education. This is societal benefit and return on investment, and these are financial return on investment. And so together, it allows for a very comprehensive program. Well, I'm certain that you have a lot of the engineers at DOE and. <clears throat> and probably administrators involved in your decision making. Do you ever involve any of the students as part of their their personal development to be involved in your programs? Right. So a lot of uh, so we actually ran a logo contest um, earlier. This is back in 2015. Ran a logo contest. So really to talk about what STEM is, and I, I know STEM can be interpreted in a number of different ways beyond just what the four acronyms of science, technology, engineering, and math stand for. We interpret it basically as using an interdisciplinary approach to solving real world problems. And there's a lot of push in the mainland as well too, to have STEM really become STEAM. And that A that's put in there is really about the arts. Mm. Because when we talk about comprehensiveness, when you talk about creativity, entrepreneurship, there's absolutely an art to it, not just a science. I agree. And so that's where the logo contest came in as well too, is to really bring in that other dynamic of creativity to the STEM curriculum. So that's one example of how we involve the students. But importantly, the model we have for the educational deliverables is really about training the trainer. So we've engaged more than 400 teachers across the, all the islands, not just the four major islands. And we train them in this curriculum. And we also have a web-based platform that they can pull from, all teachers, 
11,000 plus teachers across the um, 256 campuses can pull from this website and be able to educate and yeah, teach. They energize from, the students absolutely. and get them thinking. You know, I'm really, I'm really happy that you, you talked about the art side of it because a lot of times when we talk STEM, we're really talking about just the pure science side mm -hmm. and the technology side. And, and I have a personal bent against just that approach because I'm a fine arts major, number one. Really? And what I find in my work every day is that I understand the technology pieces because of my military background, mm. but I'll oftentimes talk to an engineer and they've got the engineering down, but they have no creativity. I mean, they can design you a very efficient, effective you know, piece of equipment, yeah. but they can't apply it to where it really makes sense. And it's marrying that art and the science and the technology all together where you actually start to make some really big changes. So Absolutely. I'm really, I'm really excited to hear that that's part of your whole No, it, it, that is a big part of it. And you, you hit it right on the nose. So when we talk about the curriculum that the teachers get, it's not just curriculum by way of paper. The vast majority of the lessons that the students are involved in is hands-on project-based learning opportunities. So as an example, some of the projects that they do, you'll actually have mini PV modules that the students get. They'll go outside mm -hmm. and they'll actually have uh, a container, a uh, tube, some water, and that module will power a small little pump. Neat. So all dependent upon the azimuth and you know the direction that the module itself is facing will obviously create a current. More or less. Yeah. Exactly, right? That'll either increase or decrease the pump's capacity. So that's one way in which they're learning about just the placement, for example, on mm -hmm. that. But really, as you expand upon, and all of our curriculum is, is segmented out, so you have curriculum that is absolutely appropriate for K to, K to 3, 4 to 6, and then you have seven, eight, and then nine through 12. Mm -hmm. So you have this kind of segmenting up so that's appropriate, right? It's not one size fits all right. by way of education. And when you get to the upper levels, when we have the academies that are being um, done at some of the schools across the 256 campuses, where they're focusing on certain things, you take Waipahu High School as an example, that is uh, engineering focused. So some of the things that they can do is they can take that, right? And then to your point about creativity, marrying and an interdisciplinary approach to engineering, when you're looking at that sort of thing, what you're able to do is also, along with the engineering, is marry what is the business case, mm. right? And you understand the numbers from a financing, not just a technical perspective, but importantly, again, you can have the best design, line up the best financing, but if you can't actually persuade someone to say, yep, that's the that's way right. we're gonna go. So then there's the business aspect, yeah. right? There's the social, there's the presentation skills, the confidence that goes along with that, right? right? Hey, making your case. Exactly, yeah. it's just simple things like learning how to put together an effective PowerPoint. And that's, that serves students in their career, their whole life. No matter where they yeah. go. Communication well, is key. School. Yeah. Great. Well, what are, when it comes to efficiency in the, in the DOE projects, what are some of the efficiency um, initiatives that you've put in place or to help the DOE get more energy efficient in their buildings? Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. of the specific things. Sure. Some of the things that uh, we've done just most recently at some of the campuses, so certainly when we talk about lighting, right? Okay. Light emitting dials, LED systems for sure, and controls and dimmability functionality as well. But going beyond that as well too, we're looking at what are the 24 hour loads? Mm -hmm. Clearly, ridge refrigeration would come up to the top, Sure. right? And so you're looking at that, you're looking at the kinds of loads that are non um, controllable that we can add controls or variability okay. to. So you talk about variable frequency drives and just putting in more efficient pieces of equipment such as electronically commutated motors, EC motors and your evaps right, in your walk-in refers and freezers, your kitchen hood exhaust fans, your ventilation fans. So a number of different types of efficiencies where, where just a sm by itself maybe is not that impactful, but when you aggregate together right. and then go beyond across the 256 campuses, it can have huge impact. How about some low-tech things like maybe agriculture, planting more trees around the buildings to cool them down or or maybe roof coatings on mm -hmm. the roofs to mm -hmm. cool them down. Are Absolutely. those things incorporated? So uh, for example, as a part of the renewable side of the program, when we're putting you know, photovoltaic systems <coughs> up on the roof, we're making sure that what we're doing is providing a better roof. Obviously, it has to last a minimum right, of 20 right. years. In some cases, the system, the roofing system itself, can be recoded so that that can last another 20 years. In some cases, we have to do a, a full re-roof. Right. And in many cases, on those buildings where right below is an AC uh, classroom, we will actually put in additional insulation. Mm -hmm. So there are other ways in which we're doing uh, efficiency work by way of building envelope as well as hardwired efficiency technologies. Okay, great. Well, we've hit our break time right now, and we're gonna we're gonna take a quick break and talk about uh, some of the other shows here on ThinkTech, and we'll be back with Brandon in a few seconds. Aloha. 
My name is John Waihe, and I actually had a small part to do with what's happening today. Served actually in public office. But if you don't already know that, here's a chance to learn more about what's happening in our state by joining me for Talk Story with John Waihe every other Monday. Thank you, and I look forward to your seeing us in the future. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. You almost caught me catching a swig of uh, Gatorade there. Welcome back to my lunch hour. Stan <laughs> Energy Man here with Brandon, uh, actually from Uptera. And uh, we're actually talking about uh, some of the things that Uptera is doing in the schools right now. We're going to pick up right there where we left off. And uh, we were talking about some of the efficiencies uh, of things that you can do in the building. Uh, we talked about roof coatings and just, you know, making sure you design the right things into the systems that you put into the building. And, and uh, as a rule, and you've heard me say this before, I always go for the efficiencies in the building first before you go and add on the PV or anything else. You try and get the building as efficient as you can, insulate it right, window films, whatever you can do to make the building efficient, then start looking at, at your renewable energy. Um, so Absolutely, it's, that's going through the pyramid, the strategic energy pyramid. Yep. So what are some of the other things that we're doing at DOE to help uh, um, not only the curriculum side, which I, th I, I totally missed the first time we met and talked in your office, but uh, you know, that's huge. It is. Um, that's great. Is. But what yeah. are some of the other more technical things that you're doing with the Department of Energy yeah. to help them out? Sure. Happy, happy to education. talk a little bit about that. So certainly on the renewable side for our islands and our schools here, photovoltaics makes a lot of sense. But as, as you know, last October, the NEM program was discontinued. And the financiers who've been essentially almost helping our economy, uh, creating almost the fourth leg of our economy through energy, are used to a particular model. And that model obviously was what the NEM had. So it's a different set of economics going forward. And given some of the constraints that are currently under the existing program, which is going to expire next October, it's, it's, PV is not the area where we're focused on right now. But having said that, we have 81 NEM systems, net energy metering systems, up to 100 kW AC that we're in the process of constructing. Some of it's already completed, but we're in the process of doing that. And those are across 74 schools on the island of Oahu. Mm -hmm. And so together, when you aggregate up those 81 NEMs, we're looking at just about 9.3 megawatts DC. Or excuse me, yeah, DC. And then I think that equates to just about 7 megawatts AC. So that sounds to me like then you're probably interfacing a lot with Hawaiian Electric in terms of, you know, managing load and things like that. And that would tie into microgridding and things yep. like that. So. Are, are you guys looking at microgrids or islanding absolutely, or anything? Absolutely, absolutely looking at microgrids. Uh, we're, we're, we tend to call them net zero energy campuses. Okay. And the, the model here is basically what we're looking at is to be grid connected microgrids, right? There's, I think there's value there absolutely for the utility as much as there is for the sure. DOE itself. You know, we, when we talk about ancillary benefits that can be benefiting the utility, mm -hmm. that's just one level, you know, of which the energy storage system can provide mm -hmm. to the utility and the surrounding community that's within that same circuit the school. And do you, do you find that HECO's open to those notions? You know, we engage with HECO and I think to be fair to the utility, during the majority of our engagement around, we were trying to create a demonstration project at Kamiki Middle School, which made a lot of sense for both the, the DOE as well as HECO itself. Mm -hmm. um, but during that time, it was right during uh, the next era acquisition. Oh, so with, they're kind of distracted. Yeah, I would say I would say distraction is, is probably a good um, explanation. But you know, we continue to want to work with them, and you know, certain folks from the utility are open to moving forward in that. In fact, we have already received three standard interconnection agreements on Maui. So working with the Miko folks, uh, we're at three schools there: one high school and two elementary schools, where we're essentially creating a microgrid for those campuses. And the idea there is to be able to take them uh, to where they stand right now and into the future, the near future, be able to make them essentially produce 
all of their on-site generation needs and to strategically be able to support through an energy storage system and how that benefit could happen going forward because the utilities are already putting forth their first pilot program on the residential level with time of use rates. Okay. So again, be able to see, would it make sense in Hawaii's environment going forward uh, for energy arbitrage, okay. util utilizing the battery strategically? Uh, like I, that. I know in some of our early discussions, um, we talked a little bit about, because you're working with Department of Education, um, the fact that civil defense, county civil defense, they have shelters mm -hmm. that are co-located at some of the schools. Do you, can you guys envision any ways where those may couple up at some point where that islanding capability or the microgrid capability, even though you're grid connected, you could essentially island yourself during a disaster and keep that shelter up and running using renewables? Is, yes. that, is that viable? Yes, so that's what we're looking to do exactly. Now there are certain schools, so there are roughly 215 of the 256 schools are hurricane evacuation centers and then less than 200 are tsunami evacuation okay. centers. But we're looking at those schools and there are certain schools, for example, in certain geographical locations. I'm from the winter side of Oahu. So for example, Castle is mm -hmm. one that is an evacuation center that meets a lot of needs on that particular part of the winter side. Because a lot of the other elementary schools, when you talk about the, when you go, you know, north of Kaneohe, and you start going, it becomes ocean, road, right. mountain. Yeah. So those are all yeah. no longer evacuation centers. So right. they either got to go all the way up North Shore or they come down to Kaneohe. Right. So Castle is a key one, as an example. Mm -hmm. So that's one that, you know, we would be looking at to see how does this make sense? And certainly when you're looking at an environment such as Castle High School, it makes a lot of sense because there are different types of shelters, right? There are shelters that are just simply hardened shells where people will go to in times of disaster. There are other ones that are designated for medical purposes, mm -hmm. right? They're more of a triage type of center. And there are others that are designated for pets as well. Sure. So looking, and there's more than just those three segmentations, but as a general rule, you're looking at those three, there are ways that we can look for that. And that's where I think when working with the utilities, for example, we can find ways that make sense for them and the DOE, and it makes sense for the community itself. That's where there's absolutely ways that we can work together. And that's where I would, I would like to, you know, essentially state that going forward, that's the areas that we're going to be focusing on because mm -hmm. it, it essentially ticks a number of different boxes. It's not just about energy efficiency or renewable energy. It really is about resiliency at the end of the day and, and potentially saving human lives when we talk about those triage centers. Sounds like I have to get my old buddies at the National Guard and Civil Defense to talk to you a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We'll do that. I'll drag them in, kick them in and scream. It sounds I good. think they think it's a good idea too. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, resiliency is a big part of getting through a disaster. Mm -hmm. and. Um, the more you can simplify Hawaiian Electric's challenges in a community, and the more you can support the community with a shelter that's up and running, viable, making its own energy and sustaining itself, yeah. just seems to make a lot of sense. It does, it at. does. And you know, when you go to the next level going deeper, is it, it begs the question, okay, so if you have enough on-site renewable generation, which for Hawaii, the vast majority is gonna be sure. renewables, such mm -hmm. as photovoltaics, and then you get a category three storm coming in that has sustained winds of over 140 miles an hour or so. That has a likelihood of ripping those panels right off. So then you have to start examining, how do we have a backup to mm -hmm. that, right? So that's where we're looking at as well too. The energy storage system provided by the, fed by the PV systems will only last for so many sure. days or hours, right? So what's gonna back that up? Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're looking at as well too when we talk about them being strategic resiliency centers beyond just the discharge charge cycle that you would have for a normal type of microgrid system that is really not looking at disastrous time mm. frames. In case we hadn't discussed it, I'm a hydrogen fanatic. So have you, have you included hydrogen in your energy storage uh, thought process? You know, right now, so we've done, the work that we're doing right now for the microgrids themselves is really looking at um, the bigger picture. But when we're looking at that backup or the backup to the backup, that's where I think hydrogen comes in. So more long term. Yeah, more long term. And again, the cost curve too is really <laughs> important right. as well because we have to be able to finance these. So to a certain extent, it's a mixture of making sure technologies that are essentially here today. For example, we know things such as PV are here and very, very cost effective. Marrying that with things that are more towards the beginning part or some who are already starting to get onto the Moore's Law curve. Mm -hmm. And that's where through that strategic combination, that's where we can get things financed and then test 
different things out because there are different geographical locations that provide different challenges, different technologies that provide different cost benefits. Sure. So that's really where I think the DOE has an opportunity because there's 256 campuses. Right. You can really start to look at different types of models feeding different kinds of needs. Yeah, Nelha hosted an energy storage conference uh, about two months ago in the Kona, mm -hmm. and that was one of the most critical uh, parts of that whole discussion was picking the right energy storage, the right battery system or mm -hmm. capacitors or or hydrogen or some other compressed air pumped hydro or whatever yep. to match the need and that fits financially uh, for the scale that you're working on. Mm -hmm. And there's some really good models out there that the national labs have come up with too um, that, that help you weed through that decision process. Yep. And a lot of it unfortunately just gets down to dollars. But At um, the end of the day it oftentimes yeah, does. So it's yes. still got to work out there. Yeah. Well, what are some of the things, you know, I mean, your company's grounded here in Hawaii and mm -hmm. does a lot here, but what are some of the, the larger scale things that uh, you do worldwide? Because I, I know it's not just a Hawaii company. Right. And uh, what are some of the things that, uh, do you keep in touch with what's going on in Europe and technologies and techniques in Europe that may, maybe you could work here in Hawaii? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I should probably explain, so Optera itself, which had roughly just a little under 400 employees nationally, so from Honolulu to Boston, we had offices across the country. Uh, earlier this year, we were acquired by NG, a Paris-based global energy company. And that now makes us 400 employees or so of a larger 153,000 global employee company. Wow. And so there's a lot of resources that you can imagine that go along with that. And obviously coming from the EU itself, and just as a general rule of thumb, the European Union is tending to be a little bit more advanced compared to the US and Hawaii when we talk about in energy. In energy yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of uh, projects that are going on there that are of significant learning opportunities for us. And they've also set up, our own company itself has set up programs that they will focus on. So microgrids, for example, and they've actually segmented out different types of microgrid residential versus commercial versus districts and so forth. And they have a number of working groups, which we're learning from as well too. And it's not just in the EU. They're, they're working throughout South America as well. And not just in the US, North America also includes Canada. They're doing a, a lot of work over there. And they have different areas across the world that they're working in, and um, Asia as well, Africa for sure. So there are, again, I'm, I'm still learning. It's not even been a year since we were acquired by NG. So I'm still learning about the vast number of resources that we can tap into. And the goal absolutely is to learn from those who've already done it, both successfully and not successfully, so that we can take those lessons, understand things technically and financially, find out what works and is culturally acceptable, and apply that model here. Not very different from what we do really well in Hawaii across the board, right? Our first Fridays that right. happened, it was straight out of San Francisco. We just Hawaiianized it. Mm -hmm. So using those kind of things, we can absolutely do and make sure that we don't do the same things and avoid the pitfalls yeah. of the past. I like when we Hawaiianize things. <laughs> it always works out better. <laughs> Are you from the uh, ITM out of UK? It's like ITM. a power company. No. Uh, my guest last week was Stephen Joseph or Stephen um, Jones from ITM, and they're a big um, electrolyzer company that's doing uh, power to gas, hmm. and um, and they're starting to build hydrogen stations in the UK that run off electrolysis and are feeding the transportation sector, huh. and um, they're looking at they're building they put in bids for five stations in California hydrogen stations, but again, like you say, they're, they're European based and, uh, and really anxious to see if they can play a role in, in the United States and in, in our market over here. Right, and being that we're the world's largest per capita guzzler of energy, yeah. I think if you can make the case here, obviously this is where there's a lot of market opportunity for right. the companies. And that's you know very much what NG is looking at as well too, right? How, how can we use the US as a model that makes sense? Like even these guys, right, who yeah. use the world's most energy per capita, if it makes sense to them, clearly should make sense to everybody else. Right. Well, Brenda, believe it or not, we blasted clean through 30 minutes and uh, we're at the end of our time here, but I want to thank you for coming on out and talking to us oh, and being thank on the you. show. And obviously, we've got some more to talk about down the road. For so, sure. Uh, we'll, we'll get you back on the Stan Energy Man, which, by the way, Stan, STEM is our acronym, too. So Stan Energy Man is like also it. STEM. But um, we're, we're artsy STEM, not just the, <laughs> the sciencey STEM. Got it. And, you got to uh, find a way to have that A yeah, in yeah. there. We'll get it. We'll, yeah. get it. we'll put a STEM. <laughs> Stan the alternate Energy Man or something. Yeah, I don't know. We'll yeah. do something. But thanks for being here, and thanks for your insight on what Aptera is doing here in Hawaii, and you know, and how big you are actually around the world. Because 
uh, oftentimes we, we get our best ideas from outside, but we do Hawaiianize them and we make them better and then we give them back to the world in a better state and they, Absolutely. they actually make, make a, a, big, a, a big improvement just because they came here mm -hmm. and they got work done here. Yeah. So thanks for your time. Thanks for coming out today and good luck with Optera. Thank and you very much for All the me. things you're doing for the DOE. And until next week, we'll sign off for now and come back and visit me on my lunch hour uh, next time. Yeah, who do I have next time? Oh, I have a friend from the Big Island coming in. We'll, we'll be a big surprise to you. We'll talk about what's going on in the Big Island. So until next Friday, aloha.